Thank you very much. I want to uh, start with a little audience participation. Raise your hand if you know the name of the first robot that landed on the moon. There's zero hands up. And there's a reason for that. And I'll talk about that a little later in my talk. But my name is Grant Anderson. I'm the president and CEO of Paragon Space Development Corporation. We're a company that's 25 plus years old, almost 27 now. And we do life support in extreme environments. Now space is the ultimate extreme environment, so we definitely do human spaceflight. Well, why do we do that? I'll talk about that in a little while from now. But first I want to talk about wonder. I want to talk about what motivates human beings. If you ask any child what they like, these are two of the answers you'll get. A dinosaurs and astronauts. I think dinosaurs because they invoke a certain amount of wonder about the past, these big beasts. And I think it's astronauts because it evokes wonder about the future. And that's something about human beings. Wondering is in our DNA. We are programmed to observe, to speculate, to go out there and try to decide and understand the, the universe. And we do things like this woman's doing here up on the International Space Station, gazing back at Earth. But what does achievement be, mean to human beings? How do achievements affect us? It's really true that we live for other people's achievements as well as our own. It's really, we do not only worry about ourselves. We actually do live vicariously through other people who achieve. I want to take you to one achievement. If you've been living under a rock for the last uh, year, this was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. And there's really no achievement that really was a combination of technical prowess and, and striving and, frankly, a fair amount of schutzpah that really showed what humans can do when they really put their mind to something. Now, mind you, we did this whole program for about 4% of the human, at the peak, about 4% of the federal budget per year. Today, we spend less than a tenth of that every year on space. But think about this achievement. How many were actually alive when it happened? There's a few of us. I have to describe a little bit more. The year was 1969. The estimates are that 650 million people watched this live. Now think about that. There were only 200 million people in the whole United States at the time, so it was more than the three times the population of this country, and we were the ones pulling it off. There were only 58 million TVs in the whole United States at the time, and I've heard one estimate, and I think it's a little high, that there were 400 million TVs in the whole world. But picture it. Families around a black and white set, fuzzy set at home, watching these fuzzy pictures come in. Crowds going where they could to see it. If you can't speak German, that says, with Apollo to the moon. Um, so there were multiple people, sometimes in the middle of the night, on the other side of the world, watching this. And watching this incredible human achievement. And with awe and wonder. And it's wonderful that I drew humanity together like that. Maybe a few more people might remember or have seen this. This is Star Trek. Um, Gene Roddenberry had it right. Really, what do humans do? We want to boldly go where no man has gone before. Of course, I want to update that a little bit, boldly go where no human has gone before. Um, but really, Gene Roddenberry was right, and the 650 million people were right about this being a seminal event and a turning point in human history. But it doesn't, wasn't designed that way. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But think about being there. What does it mean to us? Why do humans care? I mean, what was interesting to me and when I talk to people about their Apollo experience, and believe me, a lot of engineers, they'll cite, I started when I saw the moon landing, uh, including me when I was six years old. Um, 
there's a certain wonder and a certain understanding, a certain intrinsic amount of being human, as we we're talking about today, in looking for the striving towards the future and achieving something that is tough, that is hard, um, and that some people think is impossible. Why do we watch athletic events? We watch the Olympics. We watch the World Cup. Um, we watch the Super Bowl for more than just the commercials sometimes. But what we really do is we're, we're living vicariously through other people. We get taken along when people achieve, when people do something the impossible, something they've never, never done before. It really makes a difference to us down in our hearts. And that's why Apollo had such a big impact and why human space flight has such a big impact. Think a little bit about the achievements you show here, and I'll have to probably explain the one on the right. But the one on the left, even those who weren't alive, and I'm pretty sure no one was here at this time, and if they raise their hand and say, I want to talk to you, but think about Charles Lindbergh getting a small plane and braving the vast expanses of the Atlantic to go from New York to Paris. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the other, it's a little bit dramatized in the movies, but when he went to go land in Paris, so many Parisians had come running out to the field to see him, he almost couldn't find a place to land. They were celebrating the achievement, an achievement of one person, but they recognized it wasn't just one person, it was humanity had achieved something. Now, the picture on the right, here's another quiz for you. How many people think Red Bull and Felix Baumgartner hold the record for the highest skydive ever done? Hey, no end. They're good. Maybe well informed. The record actually is held by Robert Allen Eustace, and Paragon helped him do that two years after Red Bull did it. But I bring that up not to brag, humble brag maybe, but I bring that up really to talk about one thing I learned about that. Allen financed it by himself. He was an engineer. He was very interested in the engineering problems, but he really didn't want the publicity. I'll admit as an engineer, I don't like humanity looking over my shoulder when I'm trying to do engineering and make mistakes. But, so it was in our charter, and we do what our customer asks, to not really publicize it. So we broke the record, it broke in the, in the news and across the internet, and the, I got calls from international um, media all over the world, Australia and Europe and Russia, and they said, how come you didn't take humanity along with you? It was almost a, a cross between an incredulous question and an insult, you know? Why didn't you do this for us? And so through that, I learned that humanity really wants to be taken on these. They, they, it's kind of exciting if you hear about it after the fact, but they really want to experience it. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, because in the industry I'm in, I hear very often, why don't robots do it? Why do we want to spend the money to send humans? Why don't we want to do robots? Well. This here is a picture of different robots on Mars, but I can tell you a robot will only discover what you program it to discover. So if you do not have the imagination and or you don't have the foreknowledge of what might be out there, you will miss it. And I should say a robot will miss it. Things that are obvious to humans. I mean, right now, a mouse could have scampered across the, the Martian terrain in front of one of these uh, cameras, and it probably would have missed it, because it only takes pictures so often. I don't think a human would miss that, by the way. Now, I could bore you to death with talking about all of the different economic benefits of spaceflight. And very often, when people are trying to defend spaceflight, human spaceflight especially, it's they talk about the derivative products, the Teflon you use, and, of course, the cell phones. For those of you who are watching this after the fact on YouTube, you really wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't for human spaceflight and the technology that's been pushed human spaceflight. But that's pretty dry. It's economics. It's ROI. The return on investment we get is the soaring of the human spirit. It's what it does to your heart that really makes human spaceflight important. There is an intangible part, though, besides the economic part. What do these three people have in common? I'll tell you a little in just a little bit. But if you go out and you ask anybody outside of the United States what they admire most about the United States, 
Human spaceflight and the human spaceflight program will be in the top three answers almost 100% of the time. That's a return on investment that's an intangible. But how important is it? It's really the hearts and minds of humanity. So what's the common about all three of these people? They were born outside of the United States, but they all came to the United States for the opportunity. And so we are attracting the talent. We are attracting those people that want to achieve to the, these shores while lifting all of humanity at the same time. So there is an intrinsic benefit to the taxpayer of the country that's paying for it. It benefits humanity, but it also ben benefits people right here on Earth, right here in this country, I mean. And I should say, also say that if you're the first to do it, if you're the one that pioneers it, the economic benefits will most likely come to you before it goes to other people. Countries have to think about that. Are there risks? You bet. Uh, many people that I know, families of the people who have died doing spaceflight, not only here in the United States, but other countries, Russia, and in uh, Israel, there was an Israeli on, on Columbia, Columbia. Yes, there's risk, but that's also part about being human. And how do I deal with risk doing life support? I've got asked that question many times, and what I say is, as long as I am honest, open, and forthright with the person that's taking the risk on their life, and letting them know what the risk is, I've done my part. Then it's their decision whether they're willing to take the risk. I've never heard of an astronaut say I was worried about my life over and above the, I would have to do this because of what it does for humanity. Buzz Aldrin has said that he thought he had a 10% chance of not making it back, but he still went. And I know every astronaut I know is willing to take the risk in order to do the human spaceflight exploration to inspire the next generation. I was going to try to have a whole bunch of pictures of what space is sort of portrayed to in the media here, but in reality I can't because of copyright reasons. But I'll try to describe. If you've seen Expanse, if you've seen um, uh, Passengers, tend, it tends to be that they show spacecraft as um, sterile almost, big open volumes in some cases. Um, I can tell you it's not going to be like that for a lot of reasons. This is a little bit more of what, I, what it would look like. This is a picture from the International Space Station. It's crowded. It's cluttered. Um, there's not much privacy. Uh, they're all actually sleeping there. This is a little bit more about what it's like. And think about what the type of person to live in that environment. They have to be intimately connected to four, six, eight people, depending on how many go, say, to Mars, for years at a time, not just days. It takes a special type of person to do that, and I'll talk about that person. But spaces, space inside the spacecraft is very, very expensive. It's also um, very important that, uh, that it all fit inside of a rocket to get it off the ground, too. So it'll look a lot more like that. But I'm back talking about the human experience. That's what they'll experience. That's what the astronauts will experience. But how do we take humanity along? It seems like it might be trivial if you think about it. Yeah, sure, let's email us every once in a while. They'll tell us, we'll, we'll have some dialogues. Tell you, once you get three seconds by light away from Earth, human dialogue breaks down. How many people here, uh, well, I should say computers need, IP protocol has a certain amount of timeout. How many people here have gotten a timeout on their computer, right? you know, the, that it can't communicate. Or for that matter, how many people have been in a conference call and somebody forgets to come off mute for a fraction of a second and they're talking on top of each other else. That's where we'll be once humans get more than three or four light seconds away from Earth. And by the way, the moon is only one, is one and a half seconds away. Um, so really, we're almost gonna go back to the old times. I don't know if you know, but Charles Dickens, his Tale of Two Cities were actually written as serials. They were periodicals that came out in the paper every once in a while. And they were built up into a book. That's really what we're gonna see from the astronauts. It's going to be that, that, um, that sort of a one-way dialogue in a way, um, building up an experience. Now the difference between that and say like the Voyage of the Beagle, of course we didn't get that until Darwin got back from his travels. They, they disappeared over the horizon, and then they came back, and then if they survived, they told us about it. But picture this. Picture yourself at breakfast in the morning with a cup of coffee, 
talking to your children, maybe going over the latest post from the astronauts that they sent down on their way to Mars. Or maybe after you come home from a long day of work and you sit down again with your family or your spouse and you talk about and read about what's been going on. That's how it's going to be experienced and that's how we're going to take humans with us. My vision of an astronaut is not the stoic, square-jawed, you know, tough it out type of person. For one thing, I can guarantee you when you're crammed in a small can with four, six, or eight people, you cannot tough it out. You have to work it out. So what we're looking for, and what I'm looking for in an astronaut, is somebody that's articulate, well-written, and most importantly, has a high level of emotional intelligence, because that is what will allow them to convey back to us humans on the ground the real human experience, the smells, the discoveries, the size. Sure, they'll be busy doing a lot of stuff, but that's what will be important. A little about Don Pettit. He did something called Saturday Morning Science on the space station. He actually took up in his personal bag little things that we could like make a glob of water in the, um, in the, in the microgravity and then stick a needle in it and inject a dye and see how long. It was a little bit of a, I won't say it wasn't supported by NASA, but it wasn't of primary importance to NASA until it really started to take off down the ground. That spoke to people. That, people were downloading that. You can go do that. Go and do Saturday morning science and you'll see little vignettes. And they actually get better and better produced as they go along. So where are we today? It's 2019. We're really at a, a kind of a watershed here. I've been in the business 35 years. There is more momentum to go do human space flight than there has been in decades. And finally, for those who say we should cancel human space flight, I think that would betray our past. It would be a crime on our present. And it would almost be the worst thing we can do to our children. Because really, what it comes down to is being out there and being along with humanity is what, that's what human space life does. In fact, that's what being human means, is going out there and seeing what we can discover. So finally, I promise to tell you why Paragon does this. Why does Paragon do human space flight? It's because we care about the future of humanity. We want to be part of getting humanity out there among the stars. Thank you very much.